Let's go ahead and work the question that way. So if you prefer to do it that way, that's fine. Just copy it out in the first column and the second column. And then there's a bunch of forward-facing diagonals. Do your products along there. You'll get 4i and 3j and 1k. And then your backward-facing diagonals. Do your products along there. And then subtract the sum of your forward-facing diagonals. Uh, from that sum, you subtract the sum of your backward-facing diagonals. And you end up putting the i's and j's and k's together. And we end up together all with the same 3, 5, 7. 3i and 5j and 7k. So however you choose to do it is up to you, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Just remember that in the end, what are you getting? This object that we're getting, this vector, is a very special vector. It's the vector that is orthogonal to both the original two vectors. How do you check whether a vector is orthogonal to another vector? You check the dot product and make sure it's equal to zero. So if I dot this with u, I should get zero. And we do. We get 3 and negative 10 and positive 7. If I dot it with b, I should get 0. And we do. We get 9 and 5, and then we take away 14. So this vector that we get out is a vector that is orthogonal to both of the original two vectors. We haven't talked about properties of it. We haven't talked about how it's associated to the angle between the vectors, but we will now. And by the time we finish class today, you should have enough to, to, to finish that first assignment that's due a week from today. Um, it's on the dot product and cross product, and also on just the introduction to vectors. Uh, any questions before we move on? Okay. Let's take also the properties. Um, just like we had last time, let's take three vectors, u, v, and w, and a scalar c. This time it matters the order. If you do u cross v, and then you're crossing the other order, v cross u, um, you'll still get a vector that's orthogonal to both of them, but it will point in the opposite direction. We'll, we'll have a slide in a second that talk about the right-hand rule and how when you cross one direction, you get a vector that points um, out of the plane going down. When you cross the other direction, you get a vector that points out of the plane going up. And so the order matters now. It didn't for the dot product, but it does for the cross product. So it is not commutative. The cross product is not commutative. When it comes time to distribute, just like we had with the dot product, if you have a vector sum and you later want to do a cross product, that's fine. You can do the cross product first and then do the sum afterwards. But the order, of course, how you write them is very important. And so um, it would be the same as u cross v and then add to that u cross w. So it is distributive. You can distribute a scalar across a cross product, but just like with the dot product, though, you don't put the scalar on both of them. You choose one to put the scalar on. Either you're going to put the scalar on the first vector or you're going to put the scalar on the second vector. But um, we do not distribute it across and put it on both vectors. Just remember that. Same thing happened with the dot product, though. We can prove any of these, but I just, I'm just going through them now. I'm just going to use them uh, later. If there's anything you don't understand, that's fine. Um, just ask. If you have a zero vector, you try to cross it with any vector, just think about how the mechanics of how we figure out the cross product. We'll have a row full of zeros, and then what that's going to accomplish is everything always zeroing out. And so if you cross any vector with the zero vector, um, you'll get zero. If you cross a vector with itself, you'll get zero. Uh, that might be worthy of trying to prove, but um, you just you just got to work out the mechanics of it, and you'll see um, why that's the case. And then finally, if there's a mixture between a dot and a cross product, we'll, we'll give a name for this later. If you try to cross two vectors first, and then later dot it with a third vector, then it shouldn't matter. Um, the two that you start uh, associating with first. So this is, we can, we can group the, the second two, v and w, fine. Uh, or we can, we can uh, cross u and v first, and then later dot with w. We get the same thing. There is a third version of this too that involves um, u and w being, being crossed, but I don't have it on here. But the, these are all true statements about the cross product, and we can use them to say more profound things later. These are all algebraic properties and then um, later we'll look at some geometric properties, some, some, some geometry behind the scenes of this, of this cross product. Um, you guys have any questions? Yeah? OK. And then um, it's, this is a double cross product where you have uh, two vectors cross and then cross with a third vector. It's strange. You can actually work it out where it doesn't involve the cross product at all. And so it's quite cumbersome to try to calculate the cross product. And then later do, do another cross product on top of that. 
and say, I mean, we love doing dot products, and so you can do a dot product in that order, and then um, subtract it with the dot product in the other, uh, with the other two. Somehow this works, and it's an easier calculation to do. Okay, we technically should be proving these things. I'm just throwing them out there. You can prove them. I could have you prove them on an exam or on a quiz. Just work out the mechanics of how the the dot and cross work, just with generic u vector being u1, u2, u3, and the v being v1, v2, v3, and the w being w1, w2, w3. You, you, you'll see that it does work out. Okay, so those are our algebraic properties of the cross product. And um, the mechanics of it is based off of the right hand rule. Here's how it works. You'll take your fingers, your four fingers of your right hand, very important, if your left hand, I'm sorry, and so you have to get used to using your right hand. You place your four fingers of your right hand in the direction of the first vector. There's two vectors. There's a vector on the left, a vector on the right. The vector on the left I'll call the first vector. Here it's labeled A. The vector on the right I'll call the second vector that's labeled B. So you place your four fingers in the direction of the first vector, A, and then you curl them in the direction of the second vector, in this case, B, and then it's where your thumb points as to where the cross product would be the point in. So when we do that, your thumb will point in the direction of the cross product. See, the two vectors, they'll define a plane. And what will happen is when you cross, you'll have a vector that points, um, it, we'll call it normal later, but the vector points orthogonal out of the plane. And uh, later when we talk about equation of planes, we'll call that the normal vector to the plane. If you were to do it the opposite direction, just to show why we end up with the other one, use the right hand rule, it's kind of hard to do. You have to really, uh, be quite limber, but anyway, you place your fingers in the direction of B, you curl them in the direction of A, it hurts, but it does point down, out of, out, um, out of the plane pointing down, and so A cross B is not B cross A, they're opposites of each other. Okay, it's kind of hard to do, but it works out. Right hand only, so don't use your left hand. I'm sure you can come up with some kind of left hand or something, if you just adverse to using your right hand. Got it? All right, great. If you ever had physics, you've seen it before. Um, we should mention it now, though. And so, here's some of the geometric problems. Here's how they relate to um, some geometric objects. Um, the cross product is directly related to the parallelogram that's determined by the vectors. So let's take two vectors, u and v, make sure they're not zero, and we have the angle between them called theta. And we're going to see why it's the case that if I uh, take these two vectors, u and v, um, we already know this to be true, that's part of the definition, that the cross product is orthogonal to both of the original. That's nothing, you know, nothing new there. The second one is, though, it involves the sine of the angle, not the cosine, but the sine of the angle. The right-hand side looks a lot like something you saw when we were doing the dot product. The magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other vector times the sine, this time, of the angle between them. And now, it's not equal to just the cross product by itself, because if it was just the cross part, that'd be a vector. But on the right hand side, we definitely have a number, right? Um, the magnitude of the one times the magnitude of that's a product, that's a number, and then the sine of an angle is a number. And so what happens then is on the right, on, on the left hand side, we can't have just u cross v. We're talking about the magnitude of u cross v. So the magnitude of u cross v is the product of the magnitudes times the sine of the angle. To see that, uh, it'll come up later. We'll we'll, um, we'll see that by looking at the parallelogram that's determined by the, uh, the, the two vectors. If you, if, you, if you cross two vectors and you get zero, the only way that's going to happen is if the two vectors are scalar multiples of each other. They're pointing in either in the same direction or an opposite direction. But um, when you go to do the cross and end up with zero, that's what happens. Uh, I'm going to show you a, a Java application. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute where we can play around with different kinds of uh, lengths on the u and the v and, and in the end the Java applet will, will plot what the uh, cross product will be. It's a very, very nice uh, Java applet. But here's, here's um, the, the, the meaning behind why number two is true. There's, anytime you have two vectors, you said, you said when we were looking at the geometry back in section 12.2 um, that two vectors determine the parallelogram. And so I have this vector u and this vector v. And I have the length of that vector, the magnitude of that vector u, and the magnitude of the vector v. If I drop down the perpendicular from the terminal to u onto v, then I get a right triangle, and theta, remember, is the angle between these two vectors. And so if I'm trying to find the area of the parallelogram, 
any, any parallelogram has the area of base times height, and the base of this parallelogram we're going to call the magnitude of V, and so the height of the parallelogram will be found by using trig. That, that height is opposite of the angle of theta, so we'll use sine, right? The sine of theta is the opposite over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse of that triangle is the magnitude of u. And so if I want to find this height, the height of the sine of theta is the height over the magnitude of u. And so the height is that um, magnitude of u, sorry, uh, times the sine of the angle. And so that's why it's true that the area of the parallelogram is equal to that. Okay, and then finally, a uh, triangle. Oh yeah, two, two vectors define a triangle to, it would just be half the area of that parallelogram, that's all. Okay. So the magnitude of u cross v is the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times the sine of the angle between them. Okay, it represents the area of the parallelogram determined by those two vectors. Okay. There's a three-dimensional version of this. If you take a, a parallelogram for your base, and then you have a third vector coming out of this of the um, of the slide, then those three vectors determine a parallelogram, a uh, parallel pipe head. I'm sorry, and so uh, we can figure out the volume of that three-dimensional shape using using the cross product. But let me show you this Java applet first. Hopefully, it's still active. Um, it's been a while since I did this. Professor at Syracuse has this nice applet. Yeah. Oh man, plugin problems. Uh, how about Chrome? Does Chrome have plugin problems? Oh, you're on the bottom of Internet Explorer. <laughs> Oh man, I should have tried this out ahead of time. I'm sorry. That's something to be learned. Oh man. <laughs> I didn't see that. That was an option? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what's up. Run this time. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> try. try again. Oh, man. All right. Um, failing miserably here, I'm sorry. We're good. Okay. It's very useful. Good. Okay, so I have the vector A and the vector B, and C is the cross product. A and B are defined by this, this gray plane. Uh, a and B define the gray plane, and I'm allowed to drag A and B. And so I take the tail here, I take the terminal point, and I can do whatever I want with it. I can, I can sh make it shorter, I can make it longer, I can change the angle, and I can take and actually physically move the... Uh, the parallelogram to the plane too. So that whole thing about crossing with the zero vector, you get the zero vector for the uh, cross product. If you change it and do it in the other direction, then you're going to get the vector that points down. And so the longer the vector, the longer the cross product, because of the magnitude of the cross product being the product of the two magnitudes, it directly affects that. If they point in the same direction or opposite directions, we had said that your cross product should be zero, and it's just a it's just sort of get your hands dirty and play around with it, and you'll get a chance to do that. So uh, you can do the same thing, cut and paste that link uh, from the uh, from the slides once I put them up. Okay, great. Now the parallel pipe head. Parallel pipe head. Anytime you have three vectors, they determine this parallel pipe head. I think about it like a, a prism. Right? Anytime you have a prism, you just say what the base is, and this is a parallelogram. So I think about this as a parallelogram prism, and most textbooks, what they call it, the parallel pipette. Parallel pipette. 
So we have this B and C, that's on the base, and A is coming out. Not, not necessarily at a right angle, just coming out generically at some angle. We call theta this time the angle that A makes with the cross product between B and C. So I have this, I have A, I have B and C, and then I have this vector B cross C. Remember now, B cross C is perpendicular to both B and C. So these are little right angles here. It's hard to draw, but but B and C, uh, B, B and C are both orthogonal or orthogonal to uh, to B cross C. I'm sorry. Sometimes I throw in the word perpendicular, but I shouldn't. This angle theta is this angle between A and that cross product. How do you find the volume of any kind of a prism? You take the area of the base and you multiply by the height. This distance here represents the height. And so the area of the base, the base being a parallelogram, we had saw as one of our geometric properties that if you want to find the area of the parallelogram determined by two vectors, just take the magnitude of their cross product. So magnitude of B cross C represents the area of the base. And we have to multiply that by the height. Now why is the height given this symbol? What does it mean? Remember that symbol? That is the, the length of the projection vector. I'm going to project A onto this cross product, and how long it is represents the height of that parallelogram. Remember how long the projection vector is is called the component of A onto the vector B cross C, and if it happened to be a negative, we're just making sure by throwing the absolute values around it. Because remember, it's a number. Okay, well, how do, you, how do you find it? Remember our formula for the component of a vector on another vector? We had said, well, to do that, we just take the magnitude of the one vector times the cosine of the angle between them. And so now we're going to get the volume of this shape by multiplying these two things together. We had a better version of this, too. We had, we had used dot product. We had a better version of this. But, but at first, though, when we said it, it just used the tr trigonometry of the triangle to say this, this, this side of the triangle uses uh, cosine because it's the adjacent side. And so that's definitely a true statement. And now we multiply these together to get the volume, and it looks a lot like a dot product. Right. Magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other vector times the cosine of the angle between them. And so you can find the volume of this parallel of pi bed by doing the dot product between A and B cross C. It could be negative, but you don't want volume to be negative. So those bars there are absolute value bars. Whenever there's a number in between, it's absolute value bars. When there's a vector in between, they're magnitude bars. Sorry, I wish we could not have this ambiguity like that. But you know what, I think it's too much work to actually go and do the cross product first and then later do the dot product. And so there's a nice way to, to calculate this. This has a name. This was one of the properties of the, um, on the algebraic property slide. A way you can do this is by crossing first and then, and then um, adding. And so we said, uh, this, the name of this is called the scalar triple product. Okay, it's a, a, a dot and a cross. The cross is um, between the two second vectors, the dot is then with the first vector, and um, the following statement hopefully makes sense. If the vectors are all on the same plane, so that vector A is collapsed down onto the vector, onto the plane that B and C are both in, then this thing shouldn't have any volume. And so um, if the vectors are on the same plane, the name of that is coplanar, if the vectors are coplanar, then the volume of the parallel pipe head should be zero. This product should be zero. And a, and a nice way to calculate this product <coughs> using determinants is to take the vectors A, B, and C, make them rows on a three by three matrix, and just find the determinant of that matrix. It's just a shortcut technique. Nothing to stop you from finding the cross product first and then later doing the dot product. But this is, this is a, a, a faster, hopefully, uh, calculation where um, there's no i, j, and k now. We're not talking about the cross product here. We have actual numbers all the way through. So this is back to that slide that we had earlier where, okay, go get a three by three determinant, however you want to do it. Expand about the first row, 
copy down the first two columns, do the that, however you want to do it. And, and so that will be how you can calculate this number that represents the volume of the parallel of the pipe head, and it's the dot product of A with B cross C. Okay, let's go do it for us. Let's go do this, let's go work our work our calculation on this. I have vector U and V and W. Uh, U is two zero one, it's I, J, K components. V is just one one one, it's I plus J plus K. And W is uh, zero two two. So W is two I, uh, two J plus two K. So sometimes I, I only write my vectors in, with this V brace, but just know that you know, there's also this other notation that could be used. And W is 2J plus 2K. All right? And we're going to do a scalar triple product in order to find the volume of the parallel pipe head determined by these three vectors. If it happens to be zero, then they're not in the same plane, that's all. All right? We'll do the shortcut calculation. Throw all three of these into one <coughs> matrix and find the determinant of that three by three matrix, however you want to do it. I think up here I might expand about the first row, but there's nothing to stop you from copying down the first two columns and doing it that way. If I expand about the first row, the reason why that's nice is because of this zero here. When you go to do the expansion, remember what you're supposed to do. Take the entry, the number that's in that row, and then cross out the row, cross out the column, and multiply by the, the two by two determinant that's left over. It's called a cofactor. But if you have zero, then I only have to worry about what that two by two determinant is. I know that part is just going to zero out. So I, I recognize zeros. They're your friends when you're trying to do a determinant. You like zeros and take advantage of them, and um, it saves your calculation. So we just need to take two times, oh, this is also zero, right? Two minus two. Well, that's nice. So we just end up with this guy here. One times two. So the answer is two. And that represents the volume of that parallel pipe head determined by that. And here's the uh, copy down the first two columns method, where you get uh, four and zero and two, and you subtract zero and four and zero. So you get the same answer. However you want to do it, it's fine. If I ask you to check to see whether the three vectors are coplanar in the skies, I'm asking you to go calculate this and see if it's zero. Or if I tell you, Okay, I want the vectors to be coplanar, but let me throw a constant in one of these nine numbers. Then you're going to have to know that the connection between the two is that I need to go and just calculate the thing in terms of that constant and then solve for what that constant needs to be, knowing that it must be equal to zero. There was a question like that on some of these old final exam questions. Okay. All right, great. And then finally, an application, why we care. Um, let me see here. This is out of order, I'm sorry. Um, if you have just i, j, and k, and you want to cross them, here's a nice way to do that. Just think about visually what's going on. If I have i and j and cross them in that order, think about the right-hand rule, you get k. If you have j and k and cross them in that order, you get i. And if you have k and i and cross them in that order, you get j. But if you cross them in the reverse order, you'll get the opposite of those guys. You don't have to memorize that. There's a nice technique um, that you can use where you write i, j, and k in this clockwise fashion. And if, you, if, you're going, if you're going clockwise, you'll get the third guy. But if you're going counterclockwise, you'll get the opposite of the third guy. So i cross j is k, and j cross k is i, and k cross i is j. But if you go backwards, then you're going to get the opposite of the guy. So if I, if I go counterclockwise and do j cross i, I'll get minus k. And k cross j, I'll get minus i. And then if I do finally i cross k, I'll get minus j. So clockwise, you get the positive of the third guy. And then counterclockwise, you get the negative. So it's a little memory technique. And you can use this to help you find your cross product. You know, if the vectors are given to you in, in just i, j, k notation, you can use this to, to, to actually do the, to do the cross product. 
I have i plus j, which is, which is the vector 1, 1, 0. And I have i minus j, which is the vector 1, minus 1, 0. Okay. Think about this. You know, I can't do cross products if they're not three dimensional, so I just add a zero for the k component. And I can work that out, but instead I'm going to do this. I'm going to go ahead and think about foiling this thing out. I have vector i, vector j, and I'm going to foil it out. I have i cross i, and I'll have i cross minus j, and then I'll have j cross i, and I'll have j cross minus j. But we insist on one of those properties that if you cross a vector with itself, you get zero. So these guys are going to zero out. Any constant you just pull outside, that was one of our properties as well. And so this is really the opposite of j cross j, which is zero anyway. This guy is the opposite of i cross j. And this is j cross i. But we know it up here. j cross i is minus k, and i cross j is k. So we have minus k and, and minus k. You end up with uh, minus 2k. I'll just write it out. So if I take these two vectors and cross them, what I get out is uh, minus k. And you can, you know, just using that as your tool, if you feel like it, you can do your cross part like that. Otherwise, you just do it like we hadn't done it before. If you see two-dimensional vectors, just make them three-dimensional by adding a zero for the third component. This is one, one, zero crossed with one minus one, zero. And what we're getting out is a uh, minus two, a uh, zero, zero, uh, minus two. Questions on that? Okay. The main application that we have for cross product is called torque. And so we have a point that we like to rotate about, call that point P. We have a point that we like to apply our force at, call that point Q. There's a distance between the points P and Q. Think of it as like a lever. It doesn't have to be this wrench idea. And then I apply my force F at a certain angle. So I have two vectors. I have my force vector and I have my sort of displacement vector. The difference between where I'm applying my force at and where my, my turning action is happening. Okay. And so my force F is acting on a rigid body at a point Q. And that point Q is given by this position vector R. What torque is, is the measurement of the tendency of that body to rotate about the, the point P, about the origin. How likely it is to rotate. You know, the further I pull it away, the further I apply the force, then it's going to have a different amount of turning, a, ten, a, a different tendency to turn if I was to apply it closer to where the turning action was happening at. So that distance R plays a role in the calculation. And physically, torque is a vector. It's the cross product between R and F. It's a vector that's going to point, depends on how you apply the force, either in or out, at that point of uh, P, the, the origin we're going to call it. And it's how likely it is to turn about that point. What, we, what we'll be interested in is not the vector of torque, but the magnitude of torque. Um, that's the Greek letter tau that we use for torque. Uh, it's a lowercase version of the Greek letter tau. Okay? And so the magnitude of the torque is the magnitude of the cross product, but we know how to find the magnitude of cross products. We said on oh, one of our properties, the geometric property, we said the magnitude of the cross product is the magnitude of the one force times the magnitude of the other force times the sine of the angle between them. <coughs> and so that's what's going to happen. You'll be given a force, you'll be given a, a and you won't be given exactly a vector r. You'll be given a certain distance, and you'll figure out what r is. And then you have to figure out what the angle, like which, you know, how the angle comes into play. And then you just need to take the sine of the angle, and that will give you this measurement of torque. Here's the key, though. Theta is the angle between these two forces. 
Okay, so beta would be the angle between the, the r vector and the f vector. Now the r vector, when we talk about the angle between two vectors, remember they have to be placed so that the, the, term, the initial points are on top of each other. And so when you apply your force, and then r's initial point is at p, then what you should do is, is slide r down to have, to have the theta. And so I guess on the next slide I have it already worked out. Let me, um, let me work out this problem. Let's see, describe this, go to the next slide, and get rid of all this work. And let's work this problem. This is number 26 from the textbook. This force is applied at the point Q. My turning is happening at the point P. I'm given how long the vector PQ is. The magnitude of PQ is 8 inches. This, this, this vector here, call it R, is, um, has a magnitude of 8 inches. There's a problem with units, though, because in the end, um, the force has 30 pounds, and they want their answer. And when we talk about torque, uh, it's going to be in, in foot pounds. And so the 8 inches do us no good. Let's convert 8 inches into some fraction of a foot. Which reduces to 2 thirds of a foot. All right, great. So we use that. The magnitude of R is 2 thirds of a foot. The magnitude of F is 30 pounds. We want to find the magnitude of the torque. We already saw from the formula that we just need to multiply these guys together and take the sign of the angle between them. Okay? But make sure you get the angle right, though. The angle between any two vectors is the, the angle when you, uh, when you have to take their initial points and put them one on top of the other. So here's my initial point to F. I can either slide F, slide R, I have to do something. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, slide F down here and slide R down here. And all that is to show you that if this guy is F and this guy is R, the whole point behind that is to show you that, yes, that 135 degrees that they gave you, it is the angle theta. It is the angle between our two vectors. Sometimes they don't give you theta. Sometimes they give you this angle here. You just have to figure out what the right angle is to use by making the initial points on top of each other some kind of way. Just do some sliding to make that happen. But, but we don't have a calculator. But 135, thankfully, is some multiple of one of our standard angles. Okay. 135 is more commonly known as in what? In radians? Three of those 45s. 3 pi over 4. So we're talking about 3 pi over 4. That's our angle. All right, great. What's the sign of that? The sign of that is like the same as the sign, you know, think about the unit circle. That's over here. The sign of that is the same as the sign of pi over 4. It's root 2 over 2. And so uh, the magnitude of f is 30. And don't forget, this guy here is 2 thirds. So that's how you're going to get that question. And so that's how these questions are going to work. They're not that bad. If, but, um, and, and so we end up with uh, 15 root 2 foot pounds. The 2's cancel out. And then the 10 root 2. 10 root 2 foot pounds. Oh, wait, not foot slash pounds, but foot dash pounds. There's a difference. <laughs> Sorry about that. Foot pounds of force. And um, and so that's going to dictate how 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 likely the body is to rotate about that point. Put more force, it'll rotate more. It'll have a more likelihood, uh, a higher likelihood of, of rotating. Or uh, move move your application point Q down further, and then the magnitude of R will be larger, and you'll get more torque. But if you try to place the place the uh, Q right here, you're not going to get much torque because the value of the magnitude of R will be very small. Great. And you do that every day when you open the door. You don't try to open the door near the hinges. 
Question. I see a hand. Hey, how you doing? Um, what does it mean when the cross product is zero? What does it mean when the cross product is zero? In, in terms of torque? No, it's in general. Uh, in general? What does it mean when the cross product is zero? Let's go back to our properties. What does it mean when the cross product is zero? Well, if you cross a vector with itself, you get zero. We saw that with the pictures as well, with the, with the uh, Java applet. Or if you cross any vector with zero, you get zero. Okay. If, another thing though, if your vectors point in the same direction, if your vectors are either in the same direction or in opposite directions, then the cross part, where's that one at? I didn't see that one. Where's there? Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, if the vectors are or um, scalar multiples, either point in the same direction or opposite direction, and um, then you get a zero cross product. So what does that mean? If you have three vectors, yes, and you get a scalar triple product to be zero, then the then the vectors are in the same plane. Collapse this vector A down to be in the same plane as B and C. You'll have no volume. This number that we're calculating will be zero. And so that's why they um, would be coplanar. Three vectors coplanar means a zero scalar triple product. But a zero, zero cross product could be different ways. Good question. Um, could be a vector cross with itself could be zero. A vector um, cross with zero could be zero. Or two vectors that point in either opposite or the same direction um, end up as zero when you cross them. Good question. Good question. So that officially finishes off everything that I wanted to do for 12.4.